name's Jan Crawford, and I'm a correspondent with CBS News. I cover the Supreme Court, and it is my great honor uh, to be here to quote unquote moderate this event, which we were saying earlier, I have the easiest job you can imagine. I'm going to introduce these incredible legal experts, and they're going to discuss uh, what is shaping up to be a pretty remarkable term. I was thinking, you know, having Let's see, I started covering the court in 1994, so I've gone to a lot of these Supreme Court uh, preview sessions. As I know, a lot of my colleagues, we can kind of empathize about this. There will be years where you sit in the crowd and there will be a fine panel of experts assembled and there literally are three cases that you really care about. So you'll have to like kind of wait for each person to finish their remarks till you get to the one case that you're really interested in. That is not the case this year. Um, all of the cases that we're going to be talking about today uh, are extremely important, different, different, and um, I mean, again, shaping up to be, I think, what is a landmark term, but maybe with uh, not at least one of the cases that we thought we were going to get. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. They are going to talk for five or six minutes each about some of the cases that they um, are very well versed in and then kind of react to each other. And we'll may have some uh, discussion at the end, and then we'll open up to questions. So you guys feel free to, um, uh, I'm sure there's nothing that they can't answer. Um, but first of all, we're going to kind of start with um, uh, Professor Samuel Eistreicher. Um You guys, of course, all know he is a professor at NYU School of Law. He's director of the school's Center for Labor and Employment, co-director of the Institute of Judicial Administration. He has taught, lectured widely um, on matters of federal jurisdiction, foreign relations law, United States, arbitration, complex litigation in U.S. courts, and actively involved in amicus capacity in a number of cases involving the kind of the place of international law in U.S. domestic law and the alien tort statute, including uh, his recent brief on behalf of uh, U.S. foreign relations law experts in Jesner versus Arab National Bank. And in 2016, he was appointed by the UN Secretary General to serve as a member of the UN's Internal Justice Council. He's a graduate of Columbia Law School and clerk for Justice Powell. Um, he will be talking about Jesner versus Arab Bank and the travel ban cases, which he says I should refer to travel as pause. travel pause. <laughs> um, Andy Pincus is going to be up next. He is a partner at Mayor Brown and, I mean, I think distinguished Supreme Court advocate is really uh, the, the best way to describe him. He's argued 27 cases in the Supreme Court, and he's won quite a few of them. Um, <laughs> Law 360 ranked Andy's victory in AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion as the most important Supreme Court class action decision of the last 15 years. And in 2016, they named him an appellate MVP. He was recognized in 2015 as a litigation trailblazer. Um, his Supreme Court work, his defense of Mayor Rahm Emanuel's run for mayor, right to run for office, uh, cited by American Lawyer in its article naming Mayor Brown the top, one of the top six litigation firms in, in 2012. Um, I could go on and on about Andy and all of these uh, fine panelists. He's worked in the SG's office. He co-founded Yale Law School Supreme Court Advocacy Clinic. Uh, he has served as general counsel of the Commerce Department. Uh, graduate of um, Yale and Columbia Law School. He's going to talk about Epic Systems, uh, the, the, the significant arbitration case, among others, and uh, has some thoughts on several of the other cases our panelists will be discussing. Oren Kerr um, is a nationally recognized scholar of criminal procedure and computer crime law, director of the Cybersecurity Initiative at GW Law School. He's been a tremendous resource, uh, certainly to uh, not only the courts, uh, and litigants, uh, but also uh, viewers of uh, television networks and, and in the Washington Post because of the work he does in explaining uh, and teaching some of the things that the, the courts do. And he will be leaving Washington, uh, sadly for us, but happily for him to, to go teach at USC Law School in January. He's a former trial lawyer in the Justice Department's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section. He was a special assistant U.S. attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, argued many cases in the Supreme Court and the Federal Appeals Courts, testified six times before congressional committees, which will be easier, harder to do out from out there in L.A., or in maybe you want to stay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> 
Uh, but, you know, he's authored, co-authored case books, has authored the leading criminal procedure treatise, and like I said, he posts uh, regularly, making some of these complex areas of law accessible to viewers, uh, particularly on the uh, Vola conspiracy legal blog. He's a graduate of Harvard, and he clerked for Justice Kennedy. Sitting next to me is Kyle Duncan, who has argued more than, you guys getting the theme here? He's argued more than 30 cases, uh, these, these, uh, a, a panel of heavyweights um, in the federal and state appellate courts, uh, numerous cases for parties and amici in the U.S. Supreme Court and argued two cases in the Supreme Court. Uh, from 2012 to 2014, he was the general counsel of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, uh, and this uh, will not surprise you among other cases. He uh, was lead counsel in Hobby Lobby. Uh, from 2008 to 2012, he was Louisiana's first solicitor general. You're a native of Louisiana, I do believe. You're Is that right? right? Um, representing, obviously, the state and public officials before the Supreme Court, the Fifth Circuit, uh, Louisiana Supreme Court, and so on. Uh, he received his JD from LSU, LLM from Columbia, and clerked on the Fifth Circuit. And I was going to uh, commiserate with you about your school and your state, you know, and say roll tide, but after what transpired in my great state last night, I don't really think I can say much of anything. <laughs> So maybe Louisiana doesn't look so bad after all. Did Nick Saban quit? Uh, fortunately for Alabama, we still have Nick Saban. Oh. Uh, <laughs> everything else is going down, on down there. Uh, I, I don't really want to. Let's move on. Um, and finally, Carrie Severino, uh, Chief Counsel, Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network. Uh, she's testified before Congress uh, on assorted constitutional issues, brief senators on judicial nominations, obviously uh, recently taking uh, really the lead in uh, supporting the Gorsuch nomination. Um, she's been extensively quoted in the media, again, kind of bridging that, you know, kind of taking these complex issues of the law and then presenting them to the people through the media. Um, she's appeared often on television, including CBS News. Uh, and she's just written and spoken on a lot of judicial issues, particularly constitutional limits on government, the nominations process. Um, until 2010, she was a fellow and dean's visiting scholar at Georgetown University Law School. She's a graduate of Harvard Law School, and she clerked for Justice Thomas. And I might add, on the way over here, uh, she stopped by the Museum of Amer African American History and Culture uh, to see uh, its new exhibit, which does now have um, a mention of Justice Thomas. So you may want to ask finally. her about that. <laughs> you, you thought it looked. So it it took was about a year, but they they finally remembered that he's one of the most significant and, and admired uh, <laughs> African American figures in American politics certainly today. So. Um, yeah, well, and you said it was pretty well done. It's with Thurgood yeah, it, Marshall. Yeah, it, it was, you know, it's a small, a small corner he, it's, he had on him and Justice Marshall, who they had also left out. So I think they, they kind of had, had a serious blind spot. Equal opportunity. Um, <laughs> for the court, but it is now, uh, a, you know, I suppose better late than never. <laughs> I'm glad to, glad to see that the oversight has been remedied. We still, I think there's still a little bit they have a heavier focus on some of the less significant uh, issues than they need, but it's, it's good to have them there. Um, all right, so as you can see, this is uh, like the best possible group to talk about this, um, what's looking like a really interesting term after a real snoozer last year. Um, so I thought, let's start with you, Professor S. Stryker. We're going to talk about uh, Jester versus Arab Bank and the travel pause cases. Right. Uh, on, Jester involves the alien tort statute, which was enacted in 1789. And until the Second Circuit's decision in Phil Artiga, uh, this statute was cited only twice in all U.S. courts. And Henry Friendly called it the Lohengrin of U.S. law. Um, and uh, the statute is very broadly worded. It simply is a, it was a section of the Judiciary Act of 1789. It simply says there's federal jurisdiction uh, over actions involving torts committed in violation of the law of nations or of treaties. I mean, virtually no litigation on the treaty clause. But under the law of nations, since the Phil Ortega decision, there has been. Um, the Supreme Court had its first crack at this case in a case called Sosa, at the statute, a case called Sosa versus Alvarez-Macon, where the U.S. government argued that the alien tort statute is only jurisdictional. The court rejected that argument. It said that there is a cause of action there. 
Actually, the Sosa decision is almost entirely dicta, but dicta is, uh, dicta is data when we deal with the Supreme Court. I call it dicta because the Supreme Court actually rejected the plaintiff's claim in that case, but uh, Justice Souter wrote a, a very elaborate opinion on uh, the notion that modern international law violations can be reached by this statute. Uh, these actions have to involve international norms that are uh, universally accepted as binding rules and that are sufficiently clearly and definitely stated so they could be the basis of a federal cause of action. The uh, decision had lots of ex possible exceptions and open issues, uh, such as you know whether the exhaustion would be required. And one of the open issues was who are the parties that can be sued under the Alien Tort Statute. Uh, in the Second Circuit, uh, the Second Circuit took the position uh, early on uh, that uh, corporations cannot be sued under the Alien Tort Statute because there is no clear, universally accepted, definite rule saying that corporations are liable for violations of customary international law. And that is true to this day. Uh, even in situations like uh, uh, Nuremberg and with respect to the creation of the International Criminal Court, uh, corporations were not included as defendants. But there isn't, in fact, an international consensus uh, on when corporations can be sued for violations of criminal law or, or international law as a matter of their of the customary law of nations. That was the position the Second Circuit uh, took. This caused a great deal of alarm in plaintiff circles because the only defendants that are sued under the Alien Tort Statutes are corporations. And they're sued on a variety of different theories of access accessorial liability, aiding and abetting liability. Uh, so a case from the Second Circuit called Kiobel versus Royal Dutch uh, went to the Supreme Court uh, in Kiobel 1. The case was granted by the su Supreme Court. The certiorari uh, petition was granted on the theory we're going to decide corporate liability. There wasn't full briefing and an argument. And then the justices decided we want, we're going to set this case for re-argument. And so there was Kiobel 2. Uh, Kiobel, Kiobel 2 uh, was ultimately decided by the court. It went against the plaintiffs. The theory uh, that the court advanced was uh, the statute has to be read against, the alien tort statute has to be read against the, the presumption against the extraterritorial application. And uh, given the fact that nothing in that case involved the United States or any U.S. events or any U.S. parties, the court said that the complaint had to be dismissed on the grounds that it was impermissibly extraterritorial. The court left open some language which is going to require litigation. The, uh, the claim has to touch and concern U.S. interests, is what the court said. <clears throat> and there was an elaborate uh, concurrence by Justice Breyer uh, on the notion that uh, what, what, what his view of touch and concern was. So that was Kiobel II. The Second Circuit had, had a third case now involving Jessner versus Arab Bank. This is a case, again, where all of the events occur essentially outside of the United States. It involves the biggest bank in the Middle East. Uh, it's headquartered in Jordan, and the claim is that the bank has facilitated uh, payments to terrorist organizations. The bank denies this. The United States has certified that the bank's procedures are up to snuff with respect to, uh, with respect to the anti-terrorist measures that the Treasury Department and the State Department have uh, mandated. Uh, the only connection with the United States is that this bank, on some transactions that where the parties want dollar-denominated uh, uh, currencies, they have a uh, correspondent uh, bank, small correspondent bank in Manhattan, and that's the only connection with the United States. The case is now uh, went to the, it was in the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit said corporations are not liable. That's our position that we we, we announced in Kiobel One, and uh, Rosemary Pooler wrote an opinion for the Second Circuit that as much as she could, uh, criticized uh, Kiobel 1, but said that's the law of the circuit, and the case has been, uh, was granted by the Supreme Court. So the issue of corporate liability is back to the Supreme Court. There is a problem with the case because all of the events occurred outside the United States. It's a problematic case under Kiobel 2. That should have been the ground uh, that was uh, adopted by the Second Circuit. It's not the basis of the petition that's filed, although it is uh, 
strongly urged by the, uh, by the respondents, by the defendants, that the, the cases should be dismissed under uh, Kiobel II. Uh, the United States government, uh, interestingly, uh, filed an amicus brief in support of neither side where they essentially uh, said in the brief that there, there should be corporate liability under the Alien Tort Statute because there's no express exception for corporations and because there, you know, there were analogs to, to corporate liability in the United States view with respect to admiralty lawsuits against pirate ships, ships that engage in piratical activity. Uh, that is sufficient to evidence the congressional intention in 1789. The um, U.S. government said there is corporate liability, but there's a very serious question about extraterritorial application. Uh, and we, don't, we urge the court not to decide it here, but to send it back to the Second Circuit, even though there are no factual issues about the, uh, the extraterritorial application uh, question. So my prediction, ordinarily I do not make short-term predictions. I can tell you what's going to happen in 30 years. <laughs> and we'll stand by it. But wait, does that mean, so we'll be okay. You'll be okay. Um, I think it is likely that the court is going to decide the case on the uh, Kiobel two grounds of extraterritorial application. On the other hand, so I'm not going to give you a 50-50 kind of thing, that is the strong basis for deciding it. We urge in our brief another basis, and that is the alien tort statute does not apply where no duty of the United States is alleged to have been breached to a foreign nation. And indeed, the whole theory of the plaintiffs uh, in their complaint is that the Arab National Bank is breaching U.S. regulations, not that the U.S. is doing anything wrong. We think that was the purpose behind 1789 statute, and that should be a ground. Now, the court seems to want to decide corporate liability um, because, you know, I was there for the argument in, in Kiobel 1, and, and there was a degree of uh, discomfort. On the other hand, uh, it, this is, in fact, the big issue under the Alien Tort Statute. So my prediction is, notwithstanding the U.S. government's recommendation, in all likelihood, even though the court might want to decide corporate liability, this is a lousy vehicle for deciding it because of the very strong uh, extraterritorial application problem with the case. Should I go on to the other case? Travel pause. Tra travel pause. Um, now, this is a case that's very, uh, uh, very much a moving target because, as you know, there were deadlines, uh, expiration uh, dates set in the uh, initial uh, executive orders uh, by the uh, Trump administration. And now the Trump administration has come out with a new, it's called a proclamation, by the way, not an executive order. But it, to my uh, uh, reading, it seems to solve a lot of the problems that the uh, the lower courts had, not all the problems, but a lot of the problems that the lower courts had with the previous executive orders. There's no question the first executive or order was a very uh, slapdash job. Uh, when I teach an NYU class, I say it must have been an uptown job. I mean, even though I went to Columbia Law School, I, I try to <laughs> generate some NYU patriotism. Um, but a very, very sloppy job in, in every respect. Uh, this new proclamation exhibits a great deal of uh, interagency review, and it seems to do a very good job. It makes the findings that some of the lower courts insisted were missing, uh, and it changes the number of uh, countries that are involved. Uh, so I, I just did a little checklist on this. Chad has been added uh, as a nation that has inadequate procedures for information sharing and ident identity verification. Um, Venezuela has been added. I don't know if we have a lot of visitors from Venezuela. I, su I suspect we will, given the, uh, the turmoil in Venezuela. Venezuela has been added to the list. And not surprisingly, North Korea has been added to the list. All the other countries were on the, on the previous list. Two countries that are off the list are Yemen and Sudan. I don't know why entirely. I think there was a lot of uproar about having Yemen on the list. This order purports to be based on this interagency review uh, of the procedures of over 200 countries, the, their procedures for information sharing and for verification of identity problems. Uh, it's what the, the Trump administration should have done initially before they, they let out the, the order. So I think, uh, you know, it, it strikes me as a, as, a, as a reasonable attempt to, to deal with the problem. A whole bunch of exceptions to it. So happily, uh, permanent resident aliens are, are excluded from the travel pause. and. If you're here for diplomatic reasons, you're excluded. These were exclusions that were not present in the first executive orders. So I think a lot of the problems have been solved. Not all of them, 
because uh, we know there is a, the theme of the lower court opinions and the briefing was that the president, uh, the, the president is impeached, uh, not being able to use, I shouldn't use the word impeached, barred. The president is barred from exercising his plain statutory authority under the immigration laws to deal with this, with visa issues, because he said uh, incautious things on the campaign. Uh, or at the least uh, uh, statements that are capable of being viewed, reasonably viewed, as exhibiting a, a bias against uh, Muslims. Maybe that's why we have some non-Muslim countries on, on the list here. That, that's something that's being said in, in the media. This is a very odd uh, notion uh, that you can be impeached for your campaign statements, even though, in this case, we're, we're engaging in interagency review. And does that mean that the president, uh, the real practical problem is the president barred for both terms from making immigration decisions? Does the president's comments also bar the people he's consulted, like the attorney general, the secretary of state, secretary of the Department of, uh, of, uh, National, of uh, Domestic Security, what's the name of that agency again? <laughs> um, DHS, DHS. DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. I, I resist the word homeland. The Department of Homeland Security. It, it just can't be the case that we have this, this sort of rule. And of course, the Supreme Court precedent in this area is Kleindienst versus Mandel, where the court said you essentially have to take the government's word. If, it's, if the uh, document, if the agency action, if the presidential action is objectively neutral on its face, you've got to take the government's word. It's, you, don't, you can't impeach uh, for motive. Now, but, but Professor, yeah. let me get let me ask this just you kind mean, of the bottom line. You I mean, call it me seems Sam, Sam, by the way. Go. Sam, okay. It seems that I mean the court has taken this case off the calendar uh, while it considers whether or not it's moot. It seems to me that it, that you're suggesting the bottom line is that whatever is going to happen, that case is going to come off the calendar, probably will be moot, and we'll then have new litigation over right, the next think, over yeah. this right. new. Uh, travel pause that sounds to me like you're saying should withstand muster unless it, in the long run it, it long will run. it may take we're going to have this litigation i think andy and i've predicted it's going to bedevil the trump administration uh in part because we're all under a kind of trump disease whatever our politics but this is actually bad for the sound administration of laws to have this kind of uh, impeachment for bad motive when, when you're dealing with governmental action. So we're gonna have the litigation. But I think the ninth and, four, ninth and Fourth Circuits will be a little more, will be deterred. It'll be harder for them to do it with respect to this order. But, you know, it, it, I guess under the rules of the circuits, uh, once they file the complaint, uh, uh, there'll be filings before the, you know, the same panel. It'll be the, so we may end up with the same panel decisions. I'm hoping to see more of a, uh, 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 girdening of the loins and some courage from the other members of those circuits. It's a very serious problem. This happened during the Obama administration, and maybe our voices should have been uh, louder, to have a single district judge uh, issue a ruling for the entire nation. It's inconsistent with what the Supreme Court has held about their, about offensive, offensive non-mutual estoppel not being available against the government, letting the government uh, uh, relitigate issues because that's necessary to uh, for sound administration of the laws. It's a problem. So, I'm hoping that uh, the third, the fourth, and ninth circuits uh, uh, see some problem with continuing the path. But I, I, I don't think it's. I think they will find some way uh, to come back and and uh, it may have to shed some aspects of their rulings. So. We did some research this morning on a case called Munsingware. Uh, when a case is, is uh, dismissed as moot, there's no automatic vacator of the ruling, but the court on motion or on its own suggestion will uh, vacate the ruling. So the government, I think, will be happy with that outcome, vacating of the ruling, and uh, it'll be a signal, hopefully, to the circuits. All right, I know, Andy, you wanted to kind of weigh in on this. Um, thanks very much, Sam. Um, if, if you want to weigh in on this, and then just kind of, we're going to also, anyone else on the panel want to react, and then we'll take it from there. Sure, I, I, I think there certainly will be more litigation. Um, and I think, Thank you, Sam. 
you know, Sam is probably right that the motive arguments are going to become more attenuated as time goes on. But, but to me, the interesting arguments uh, are the statutory authority arguments, which was the basis of the Ninth Circuit's decision. The president relies on uh, this provision of law, 1182F, which seems to give very, very, very broad authority to a president to bar the admission of almost anyone uh, for any general reason. And one question uh, that the Ninth Circuit grappled with is, could that really be so open-ended? Wouldn't there be a delegation problem if the authority was really open-ended? Is there some judicial review? If so, what are the limits? And some people have said, for example, that one of the limits, if you look back at how this authority has been used in the past, was time-limited. This is the first time uh, that the authority will be used to permanently, at least with no time limitation, uh, impose restrictions that are different from those that were enacted by Congress. And if that authority is upheld, you really wonder about the stability of our immigration system because a president presumably could just say, I'm going to rewrite the immigration laws using this authority and override all of the rules that Congress set up for various categories of, uh, of immigration and, and visas. And that seems like that would be a very strange result. So my guess is there'll be a lot more focus on both the duration and uh, whether there's some justification for overriding the otherwise existing rules that, that Congress put in place, for example, to screen out terrorists. But the bottom line, I mean, this we're not going to be getting arguments in, in, in no, travel no, ban this no, year. No, I don't think, I think the Supreme Court is going to say the, the, the order that we granted review to consider is gone, is moved. and <laughs> this is going to be sent back, and there'll be lots more litigation. Good for lawyers. <laughs> All right, Bill, do you want to talk about a case that we actually are going to hear arguments on? Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, I will do that. Uh, I have to break one comment about Jesner and the Alien Tort Statute, just because this group will appreciate it in particular. In the Sosa case that Sam referred to, Justice Scalia uh, filed a separate opinion, uh, basically saying, although the majority says they're just opening the door a crack to claims under the Alien Tort Statute, that won't be so, and this will be the font of lots of litigation, and he was incredibly prescient because since that day, there has been uh, a whole little industry of alien tort litigation that uh, that bottle has not, the genie hasn't been close to putting, been put back into the bottle. Um, All against corporations, by the way. Yes. Uh, well, that's where the money is. Uh, so thanks, first of all, to the Federalist Society for inviting me. This is always a, a great event. I'm gonna talk about uh, the arbitration uh, cases uh, called Epic Systems. There are three cases that were granted and consolidated, Epic Systems, Murphy Oil, and Ernst & Young. Uh, they are the first argument in the term of the term uh, on the first Monday in October at 10 o'clock, and uh, probably the most consequential arbitration issue to come before the court in the last four years, even though there have been uh, a number of arbitration issues. And just to make a disclosure in this case and probably a bunch of the other cases that we're going to talk about, I've filed briefs for various parties. Um, the question in this case, uh, put simply, is, is it an unfair labor practice to include a class action waiver in an agreement to arbitrate that is part of an employment contract? Uh, since employment arbitration agreements uh, routinely include class action waivers, this case affects the validity literally of tens of millions of arbitration agreements around the country. Um, people sometimes hear the NLRB or the National Labor Relations Act and they think, well, that only really has to do with unions. Not so. Uh, its authority uh, extends to all employers of over a very small number of employees. So this is a dis a, an issue with very broad ramifications. Um, the Supreme Court held in uh, 2011 in the Concepcion case uh, that the Federal Arbitration Act preempts state laws uh, that would invalidate arbitration agreements with class waivers uh, because the FAA uh, preserves the idea of individualized arbitration, one-to-one -one dispute resolution as a core aspect of arbitration. Uh, so the NLRB, uh, just uh, the very next year, in 2002, uh, ruled that it is an unfair labor practice to include a class waiver in an employment arbitration agreement, uh, relying on Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, which, just to give you some statutory language, um, protects the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively, and this is the key language, to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. Uh, the NLRB said that catch-all clause uh, includes uh, the right to 
participate in class actions. Uh, class action waivers prohibit class actions, and therefore they constitute a violation of Section 7, and violations of Section 7 are unfair labor practices, therefore they can't possibly be enforced. And the board said the FAA uh, does not bar the application of the NLRA to invalidate all of these agreements. Um, but uh, there is a long line of Supreme Court cases that hold that uh, the Federal Arbitration Act does not just preempt state laws, it also applies to federal laws in a similar way. It limits the applicability of federal laws that would invalidate an arbitration agreement unless there is an expression of congressional intent to the contrary in the text of the other federal statute. In other words, the FAA sets up a general presumption that federal law is favorable to arbitration and a general presumption that arbitration agreements will be enforced according to their terms unless there's something in some federal statute that indicates Congress meant to override that general rule. Uh, the problem here is that Section 7, the language I just read, doesn't say anything about arbitration or litigation. Uh, it does talk about collective action, but all in the bargaining context, labor organizations, things like that, it's awfully hard to see in, the, in those words a congressional decision uh, to favor litigation over arbitration. Um, and that's basically the argument of the proponents of the arbitration agreement. They say Section 7 doesn't contain the necessary congressional intent, and the NLRB can't fill that in by interpreting ambiguous language. Maybe it can say that outside of the arbitration context where the FAA <coughs> applies, there's some protection for class actions, but it can't supply the requisite congressional intent to override the FAA. Now, the other side says uh, this is a substantive right conferred by the NLRA. Substance is important. All of those Supreme Court decisions that I mentioned talk about procedure. Uh, for my money, uh, any argument that turns on the difference between substance and procedure really doesn't is labeling and not substance. Uh, and so it's hard to say why something is procedural if there's a statute that says you have a right to go to court in the context of some creating some cause of action. Why is that procedural, but this, is, but this is substantive? Very hard for me to see the distinction. And of course, the Supreme Court has said repeatedly that Rule 23 is a procedural provision. Um, the opponents also rely on the FAA's savings clause uh, the very end of the critical section of the FAA, Section 2, says uh, arbitration agreements are enforceable and the magic language is save upon grounds as exist at law or inequity for the revocation of any contract. So they say, well, the NLRA makes this contract illegal. Uh, therefore, uh, all that's happening here is we're applying the general rule that illegal contracts are unenforceable. Uh, the problem there is that if that were true, all a state would have to do would be to pass a law saying all arbitration contracts are illegal, and then say, oh, we're not singling out arbitration, we're just applying the general rule uh, that uh, illegal contracts can't be enforced. So that proves too much, I think. Um, a little bit of background on the case. Uh, the Obama, this is not a one-off uh, Obama administration anti-arbitration rule. There was a whole raft, uh, post-Concepcion in particular, of anti-arbitration regulations issued by just about every alphabet soup agency you can think of, HHS, Department of, Ener Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, many of those have been enjoined or reversed. Uh, this one uh, hasn't been, although it'll be interesting to see if the NLRB continues to stand behind its decision on Monday uh, the fifth member of the NLRB was confirmed, and so now there is a full complement uh, of NLRB members, and so who knows what uh, the current NLRB's view is of, of this rule. Certainly some of the existing members dissented uh, from the application of this rule in some cases that they decided. Um, the other interesting thing to note about this case is uh, the Justice Department, although in the Obama administration, it filed uh, a cert petition on behalf of the NLRB after the change of administration. Uh, the department authorized the NLRB to continue to litigate the case, but filed an amicus brief uh, on the other side of the case, saying that its view uh, was that the NLRB's position uh, is wrong. 
uh, not at all an unprecedented thing to happen in a change of administrations. Uh, that happened a number of times in the Carter administration, uh, but, but certainly has given the case uh, some extra profile. Um, I want to, if I can, talk briefly about one other case, a uh, case called oil states. Normally, when I mention patent law in a, in a general audience like this, people say, oh my god, you know, is he going to put up some formula or diagram? Uh, and I, my rule about litigating patent cases is don't ever handle a case that has a formula or a diagram, because <laughs> that's too scary. Stick to the law. But, but oil states uh, is, arises in the patent context, but it's a quite important separation of powers uh, case. And I think, as we'll talk about later, this term, one of the themes, may well end up being a very significant series of rulings on separation of powers issues, depending on what happens uh, with some cases are in, that are in the pipeline. So as everyone knows, patents are granted by the Patent Trademark Office. Um, recognizing that errors can occur, uh, particularly because the granting of patents is not an adversarial process. Patent examiners may not uncover all of the relevant information. Um, Congress created a procedure for third parties to petition the PTO for correction of erroneously issued patents. Uh, that procedure sort of was first created, the first version was created in the 1980s. Uh, it's been revised a couple of times, most recently in 2011. Um, and those decisions of the PTO, of course, are, are reviewable in the Federal Circuit. Uh, that process is being challenged on two constitutional grounds. First of all, as a violation of Article Three, that it's an intrusion on the judicial power to allow adjudication of these questions by an Article I tribunal, because these are private property rights. Uh, Justice Thomas wrote a dissent in a case called B&B Hardware in the trademark context in which he adverted to this uh, being a potential problem. He didn't come down one, or, one way or the other, but flagged it as a, as a question uh, in the trademark context, not in this patent context. And the second constitutional allegation is that this is a violation of the Seventh Amendment, that uh, the patent owner has a right to a jury determination of the issues relevant to the um, validity of the patent. Um, the argument on one side is this is a property right, and property rights should be protected by these two constitutional provisions. Uh, the argument on the other side basically has been this is a right created by the government. It doesn't exist apart from the grant by the Patent and Trademark Office. And therefore, the PTO reconsidering its own decision uh, doesn't breach any constitutional constraint. Um, interestingly, there's some Seventh Amendment history uh, in, in England of the chancer, the courts of chancery uh, invalidating patents uh, challenged on, uh, by third parties. So in, history is always critical in the Seventh Amendment context. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of debate about public versus private rights. Again, I think this is a little bit of a labeling uh, fight. The, the court has said public rights can be adjudicated by non-Article III tribunals. Um, I think some patent owners are worried that if patents are put into the public right category, that may call into question takings and other kinds of protection. I don't think that's necessarily true, uh, but I think that's part of the argumentation uh, that you'll hear. In the big picture, uh, big consequences for the patent system, depending on how this comes out, there's been a lot of concern uh, about overbroad patents strangling competition. Obviously, if there's a patent and you have a new invention, that patent could be blocking your new invention from getting to market. Uh, and so if that patent is overbroad and was it unlawfully granted, you'd like to have it taken out of the way. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay that patent owner some kind of a toll in order to get your invention to market. So big competition questions in the patent system and more broadly for administrative adjudication as a whole, uh, if this government-created interest uh, can only be uh, looked at and perhaps revised by an Article III tribunal. What does that mean for other government-granted interests? We can all think of licenses, benefits, payments, all kinds of things. Do those things all have to be put into the Article III court system? Thanks a lot. I know Sam wanted to follow up, but I'm going to, can we just hold that till the sure, end? Because um, we still have wedding cakes, uh, cell phones, political redistricting. Uh, online, but so we'll, we'll and campaign, yes, yeah, so gambling, yeah. Um, so we'll, but let's remember, yeah, so um, we'll come back to that at the end. But I'm going to go to Oren now, who's going to talk about Carpenter. 
Great. Uh, thank you, Jan, and thank you to the Federal Society for the invitation. Uh, Carpenter versus United States is probably the biggest Fourth Amendment case that the court has had in at least five or six years, maybe longer. Uh, it is uh, bringing together a bunch of important questions about how the Fourth Amendment applies to new technology, to the internet, um, to a world in which we're using new devices and the government's collecting uh, new kinds of records. Uh, and the question is, what's the line between what is up to Congress uh, and what is up to the courts? That is, what is something that we can have privacy legislation on and what is something that the courts say this is covered by the Fourth Amendment prohibition on unreasonable searches and seizures? Uh, the question in the case is about cell phones. Uh, in particular, whenever your cell phone is on, it's trying to communicate and likely is communicating with local cell towers, which it needs to deliver the call uh, or, or text messages or anything to or from your phone. Uh, your phones don't work by magic. They work by connecting to local towers uh, that the cell phone companies own, and then they route your communications for you. It turns out that the uh, cell phone providers keep records uh, about where, which cell towers were connected to which phone accounts uh, historically. So your phone uh, company has a record of which towers you used to connect uh, uh, when, you were, when your phone was on or when calls came in uh, and, and when you sent calls. Uh, and those records can be very useful in government investigations to get a basic idea of where somebody was located. They're not particularly precise records. Usually they vary, but usually we're thinking sort of whether somebody's in a particular neighborhood, not whether they're on a particular block or in a building or in a room. Uh, but so the information of knowing where a phone was in what neighborhood is not hugely important on its own, but can often be very useful when combined with other information to figure out, for example, a group of people went from one area to one area. In the um, Carpenter case, it was used by the government to show that Carpenter and his co-conspirators were in the area of a string of robberies. Each robbery would occur, and what do you know, all the phones used by the conspirators were always in that area, it helped to show that Carpenter uh, and his co-conspirators were the ones behind the robbery. The government collected records about the location of Carpenter's phone uh, from two cell providers covering more than 100 days of coverage, so a lot of records uh, obtained. Uh, and it did so under a federal statute called the Stored Communications Act, uh, in particular a provision enacted in 1994 which says that for the government to collect non-content records about an account, whether it's an internet account or a telephone account, uh, the government needs a court order from a judge and it needs to show specific and articulable facts that the uh, information to be obtained is material to an ongoing investigation. This is for those of you that follow Fourth Amendment law, the Terry versus Ohio standard of what the government needs to do to stop somebody and temporarily detain them. Congress enacted that same standard in 1994 for non-content records and that includes uh, cell site records. Uh, so the government went, got these court orders, used uh, the, the location information. The question in the case is whether the Fourth Amendment uh, uh, effectively requires a higher standard, the probable cause standard, and whether obtaining the records about individuals' location uh, from the cell site records collected by the providers uh, is a Fourth Amendment search of the interests of the users that would require a probable cause warrant. Uh, two questions in the case. Uh, one, is it a, a search of that person, their interests, uh, uh, to, to get the records? And then second, uh, uh, if it is a search, is it a probable cause requirement search, or maybe there's some lower standard, like perhaps the statutory standard? Uh, so those are the, that's the issue in the case. It's hugely important, because although this case is just about uh, cell site records, really, it's, it's about much more. This is the first case that has touched on Fourth Amendment rights, what is a search in the context of new technologies in several years, and really the one that is getting to uh, the fundamental basis of what is, what is constitutional and what is not covered by the Constitution in the surveillance laws. The traditional rule that the uh, Supreme Court uh, has supplied is that the government it does not conduct a, a Fourth Amendment search when it is obtaining records from a third party business. Uh, so there's, you can sort of imagine the world from an investigator standpoint. There are some investigative techniques that aren't covered by the Fourth Amendment, uh, other techniques that are covered by the Fourth Amendment. Government d it doesn't conduct a search to use an undercover. Government does conduct a search to wiretap uh, a, a phone line. Um, government doesn't conduct a search if it collects 
uh, bank records from somebody, but does conduct a search if the government goes into some, breaks into somebody's home. Uh, and so the, the, the world of criminal investigations is divided between things that are searches and things that are not searches. And that line is really what's at issue in the Carpenter case, not just for cell site uh, records, but for uh, internet records, for bank records, for um, credit card records, for telephone uh, records of who called what at what time. Uh, this is really going to be about where do we draw the line between what is constitutionalized and what is not for broader surveillance powers, broader than cell site records. Um, so, so it's a hugely important case. The government, in its, its brief, which was filed just two days ago on Monday, uh, relies on the court's precedents uh, effectively established that third-party business records are not, uh, uh, can be collected without a search occurring. They're the third party, uh, somebody who's communicated with a third party, given their bank records to the bank, or called uh, the, uh, called the phone company effectively to deliver their phone calls. Uh, the companies there have collected these third-party business records. It's not a search for the government to go to that effectively sort of eyewitness to the conduct and say, give us your records about what you saw. Uh, and so Smith versus Maryland and United States versus Miller cases from the 1970s, which are probably the best known example of these uh, uh, cases, uh, would say that it's not a search for the government to collect the cell site records. And that was the reasoning of the Sixth Circuit and other courts of appeals uh, below. On the other hand, Carpenter says, uh, we're in a new technological world here. We can't follow necessarily the old uh, rule that was used in a different technological era. And Carpenter relies a lot on the concurring opinions in United States versus Jones. Uh, Jones was a case from a few years ago involving installation of a GPS device, uh, a tracking device on a car, collected information about the whereabouts of the car, very precise information over a long period of time. Uh, I think it was 28 days. And the uh, majority, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, says a search occurred when the government installed the device. But the concurring opinions, uh, collectively including five current justices on the court, said that there should be a different rule, that it was over time the collection of the records were so precise and they collected so much information about somebody that at some point that became a Fourth Amendment search. Uh, the, the reasoning of Justice Alito's concurring opinion being that you know, short-term surveillance is different from long-term surveillance. Nobody would expect long-term surveillance uh, to, to occur for the government to collect so much information. And therefore, that begins to violate a reasonable expectation of privacy at some point. Uh, Carpenter says, well, this is just like Jones. Uh, this is a long-term collection of, of records. Government responds, this isn't like Jones at all because the records are so much less precise. And here we're dealing with third-party business records traditionally covered under the old rule that it's not a search. Um, what I think makes this case fascinating beyond its importance for the internet uh, and for the technological era, there, there's so many directions the court could go in and so little of what the justices have written themselves on these issues. So uh, the court took this case without a split. Uh, there was no clear split uh, from the courts of appeals suggesting they wanted to take a look at it. Which of course, that maybe suggests maybe they want to have a different rule because they didn't wait until there was disagreement. But I suspect, this is just my speculation, that they wanted to take a look at something which is hugely important to the structure of government investigations in a networked world and on which none of them were on the court when the precedents that they're relying on had been decided. So we have cases from the uh, 60s and 70s and early 80s. The current justices were not on the court at that time. And I think they want to take a look. And there are just a lot of different places they could go. Really tough to predict, I think, what, uh, uh, what the court might do. Uh, you can look at the concurring opinions from Jones, say maybe they'll go with that. But there are also reasons to think that that was kind of a one-off for that one kind of case and that this case is distinguishable. Uh, in particular, an interesting angle to watch, I think, is the role of legislation. So in the Jones concurring opinion, Justice Alito says, uh, in the absence of legislation, it'd be great if we had uh, legislation that covered uh, the, the use of GPS devices. In the absence of legislation, we'll, we'll look, you know, adopt this Fourth Amendment rule. And Justice Sotomayor, in her uh, Jones concurring opinion, also suggests that in the absence of a coordinating branch doing anything, we need to cover this uh, un under the Fourth Amendment. Uh, well, the cell site question is something that legislators have been very active on. Uh, so Congress enacted the 1994 
Terry versus Ohio standard that applies at the state and federal level. Uh, Congress has had a bunch of hearings, by my count five of them, on whether to raise the standard to probable cause over the years since then. Several states have enacted a warrant requirement uh, uh, for collection of cell site records that would only apply for state and local investigations. So we've got a lot of legislation, including quite recent legislation at the state level, and it'll be very important and interesting to watch whether the existence of legislation makes the, or leads the justices to think about surveillance a little bit differently and makes it more kind of where does the court step in where the legislatures have acted versus the court sort of occupying the field. Uh, traditionally in Fourth Amendment law, it's sort of the courts are nothing. You, you know, if it's a question of whether the uh, government needs a warrant to break into to a house, that's going to be uh, something that's a traditional Fourth Amendment function. And here we have the added angle of new technology uh, and also legislation being active here, and, and the court's going to have to figure out you know, what is up to legislatures and what is up to the courts, again, introducing or reintroducing this separation of powers theme to the current term. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Do you want to uh, mention uh, the one that's working its way up, Microsoft? Do you want to just come back to that at the end? Uh, whichever you, uh, whichever you Why don't we come, remember to come back to that? Sure. But I mean, I guess just going back to Carpenter then, I mean, um, so like sometimes you tend to, we tend in the media at least, to, as you guys all know, uh, exaggerate things sometimes. Like this is, you know, the most significant, but I mean, this is really a case that is kind of, as you're saying, on the, on the cutting edge of how the Fourth Amendment is going to kind of unfold in this new technology world we're in. Yeah, this is the case that's gonna- I mean, you, can't, you can't overstate the importance of this case, really. Well, as somebody who writes in this, I think the entire world is basically uh, on this. I have a lot of law review articles that are either going to be prescient or completely outdated based on what the court does. Um, but, but yeah, this is really, um, you know, this is the case that's going to determine limits on the government's surveillance power at the state and federal level in new technologies for years to come. And I think the justices know that. This is not a, a surprise to them or a secret. That I, I think they took this case in order to figure out, OK, what are the surveillance rules in this new technological era that we're in? And it, it, it's funny, if you look at the briefs in Carpenter itself, you think, well, wait a minute, wh why does this matter? So already there's a specific and articulable facts statute, so that's one threshold, and a bunch of states have gone to probable cause. Uh, the stakes for cell site data are actually much less significant, I think, than for all the other information. Uh, so this is a case about cell site records technically, but really it's about internet surveillance. It's about uh, uh, network surveillance um, in a world that the justices are certainly aware of, moving towards online communications and, and spending you know, a lot of time on the internet, and I, as, as many of us certainly I do. Um, you know, this is the case that's going to set the ground rules for that. So, you know, certainly the FBI is, uh, cares a lot about what's going to happen, and the NSA cares a lot about what's happening. And, you know, this this is going to be really the big surveillance case for the internet. Um, happens to arise this term in the context of cell site records. All right, great, thanks a lot. Um, all right, so we're going to go to Kyle now to talk about wedding cakes and uh, maybe a little Thank bit you, about Jim. betting. Yeah, I get to talk <laughs> about cakes and gambling and Governor Chris Christie. So I, I get to I get to talk about the, the really interesting cases. And, and Christie is not involved in the cakes case. Not the cakes. Okay. Case. No, that, that's, that's the gambling case. Sorry, that's I couldn't right. resist. That's all right. I, um, the Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Phillips. Uh, I'm sorry, versus um, Colorado Civil Rights Commission uh, is as Orrin was saying. If that's a blockbuster Fourth Amendment case, this is a blockbuster First Amendment case. Uh, because it poses uh, for the first time, and, and of course not long after the Obergefell decision, about the conflict between uh, the rights of same-sex couples to marry uh, and also to be uh, free of discrimination in, in public accommodations, uh, put over against the, uh, the rights of a religious uh, entrepreneur uh, not to participate in a ceremony that violates his own religious beliefs and also not to engage in uh, speech or expressive activity uh, that he doesn't wish to engage in. So th this is this case has gotten a lot of attention already. Um, it was relisted. So I tried to count something like 14 times, which is uh, Scotus Blog can tell me if that's a record or not. But 14 times, it was finally granted almost a year after it was first uh, filed. What are the facts? Petitioner is a Christian cake designer or cake artist. Um, if you watch as, as much HGTV as we do in my home, you know that there are shows about cake artists. 
uh, Ace of Cakes, I think, is, is, is a particularly good one. Um, uh, the, he declined to design a custom wedding cake uh, for the respondents who were a same-sex couple. They wanted the cake for their, uh, their upcoming wedding. Um, when they filed a complaint against Mr. Phillips, is his name, Jack Phillips, um, he was found to have violated the Colorado Anti-Discrimination Act for engaging in sexual orientation discrimination. Uh, and he was ordered to engage in various remedial measures such as re-educating his, his staff, uh, uh, providing uh, cakes on an equal basis for uh, gay and, and straight weddings, uh, and other measures like that. The Colorado courts rejected his argument that uh, this application of the anti-discrimination law violated his rights under the Free Speech Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the First, of the First Amendment. Um, there's so much one could say about this case. Let, let me just, and, and the briefs have come in on one side but not on the other, so I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage. Uh, the petitioner and his amici have filed you know, tons of amicus briefs, as you might expect. Um, let me just sketch out what uh, I imagine the free speech claims are going to be on both sides, not just one. Um, the free speech claim uh, is going to come down to some very basic and interesting questions that free speech law doesn't quite totally settle, as you might ex expect, such as when, um, when a cake artist or is it, you know, some sort of or artist that's not a traditional artist that we think about, is he engaging in First Amendment protected expression by designing a wedding cake? Um, and if not, is this the kind of expressive conduct that we might see in cases like, um, like O'Brien versus United States, which is the burning the draft card, where somebody engages in conduct that has an expressive component. Uh, if it's expression under either one of those categories, is application of the anti-discrimination law compelling speech in violation of the First Amendment? So the briefs on the petitioner's side are talking about a lot of very familiar, uh, but you know, as, as Oren was saying, very old cases that don't address anything like this scenario. Uh, instead, the, you, you'll, you'll end up talking about cases like Barnett, West Virginia versus Barnett, which is the pledge case involving Jehovah's Witness student who didn't want to be forced to say the pledge and who won, of course, in that famous decision from, I think, from the 40s. Um, uh, needless to say, the petitioners are trying to uh, construct their case so that it's the next Barnett case. Um, and then there's a num number of other uh, First Amendment compelled speech cases, such as Hurley, uh, the Irish uh, parade, uh, gay parade marching case, uh, Woolley versus Maynard, the live free or die uh, case. Uh, I, I just spent a, a long time in Maine, and we saw a lot of cars from New Hampshire. I point out to my children every time a live free or die car would go by that, that look, that's an important constitutional principle there, and they, they were not interested at all. Um, on the respondent side, um, and I'm judging this from the way that the Colorado courts dealt with the issue, and although they might develop all sorts of new arguments as well. Um, I would imagine the respondents are going are, are to stake their ground on one, one point, for example, the, uh, the, the activity of making cakes isn't speech. It's not expressive conduct uh, at all. It's not inherently expressive. And so the case is far less like uh, a case like Barnett or Hurley and more like Rumsfeld versus Fair, which is a very recent case involving law schools who objected on expressive association grounds to hosting uh, military recruiters during the time of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And they lost that case uh, because, oversimplifying, the court said that's not inherently expressive activity uh, to host military recruiters. Um, they might also ask, uh, I, I imagine their briefs are going to ask, well, if it is speech, uh, whose speech is it? Isn't it the couple's speech uh, who's getting married and not the baker's speech? Uh, these are very interesting uh, claims. You've got a ton of amicus briefs on their side. Uh, I have to say the most interesting brief is filed on behalf of neither party, but it's filed on behalf of cake artists. Uh, and it's full of beautiful, full-color pictures of cakes uh, <laughs> that are astonishing, astonishing. Uh, my favorite, uh, and I hope this doesn't reveal too much about me, is a cake, a cake where a cowboy is riding on a pig. Uh, and it's just an astonishing cake. I have no idea why somebody would want a cake like that. Uh, uh, it's probably very private, but, uh, but it's a very, very interesting uh, cake. Uh, and uh, I, I think the point of the brief, as it said, is not to support either par party, but to show that there is, in fact, expressive uh, activity in making cakes. Um, very quickly, uh, there's also a free exercise claim, just to raise the stakes of this case even higher. 
uh, the free exercise claim is that by compelling the petitioner to engage in what he considers a, uh, a, a religious event, a wedding that goes against his beliefs, by, by compelling him to participate in a meaningful way in that, it's forcing him, uh, to, it's violating his free exercise of religion, as opposed to abstain from doing that. Um, and the, the, the technical legal issue uh, it, 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 un, under that claim is extraordinarily important. I don't know if the court will reach it or not, but it's how the Smith decision, the infamous Smith decision from 1990 applies. Smith says that a law that is neutral and of general applicability uh, essentially can't burden free exercise rights. Uh, that's oversimplifying, but that's what Smith seemed to say. It's very controversial. Justice Scalia wrote the opinion. Um, and so the question is, is the Colorado anti-discrimination law here a neutral law of general applicability? Uh, or is it being applied by Colorado in a way that is not? Uh, and the petitioners, and I, I don't, again, I don't know what the respondents are going to say back to this. I'm sure they have an answer. Uh, but the petitioners are saying, look, there are cases uh, from the Colorado Civil Rights Commission that have recently allowed cake artists to refuse to put anti-homosexual or anti-gay rights messages on cakes. And so they're not playing fair. They're, they're playing favorites. Uh, by, by uh, requiring the petitioner in this case uh, to have a, a, a pro-same-sex uh, marriage message on his cake. But that raises a very interesting issue about whether the record actually discloses what he was asked to do on the cake. Uh, I don't know that it is. I, I was reading some, uh, some commentary on the internet that suggests that, well, that, there's nothing in the record that says he was required to put a pro-same-sex uh, marriage message on the cake. Um, and so that raises all sorts of interesting questions. Uh, the case will be a blockbuster. Um, about 20 states have come in on the side of the petitioner. Uh, and uh, we'll see, no doubt, states and all sorts of amici on the other side. Um, I'll be quick about this as I transfer over to Governor Christie and gambling. Um, Christie versus every sports league you ever heard of, NCAA, NBA, NFL, NHL, uh, Ma Major League Baseball. Um, are in, involved in a titanic dispute uh, over federalism. Uh, this is an anti-commandeering case, uh, which, as you acolytes of federalism know, is a very important Tenth Amendment doctrine that says the federal government can't essentially tell the states how to legislate or tell state executive officers uh, to administer a federal program. Those are uh, cases of New York versus United States and Prince versus United States. The court hasn't had an occasion to revisit this doctrine, but now it does in this very interesting, and, and I have to say, as I got more into this case, difficult to understand uh, both procedural and substantively. Um, what's the federal law at issue? Let me try to simplify it. Um, the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, or PASPA, is a 1990 law that prohibits states from doing a bunch of stuff, I paraphrase, uh, with respect to sports wagering. One of the things that it prevents states from doing is from authorizing sports gambling by law, uh, which I think will turn out to be the key statutory phrase in this case. Uh, New Jersey initially had an exemption from PASPA if it wanted to start a regulate sports wagering in its state within a year of, of the passage of the law, but it didn't take advantage of it. Uh, but then in 2010, evidently it had second thoughts and decided to enact a regulatory scheme to regulate sports wagering, uh, which of course violated PASPA. Uh, it was sued by all the sports leagues uh, in a case called Christie One, and it lost in the Third Circuit. And specifically, it lost on the issue, uh, the, the, the argument that it was making that PASPA commandeers states. And when I first read that, I thought, well, how does PASPA commandeer states? It just says, don't do that, right? That doesn't sound like commandeering. But as I got more into it, it got a little bit more complicated because the way that the Third Circuit seems to interpret PASPA is to say, if you repeal existing prohibitions on sports wagering, which of course don't apply just to the state, but apply to private parties, then you've authorized sports wagering by law, by repealing your state law, which if that's true, if that's how PASPA works, and of course the sports leagues will say that it doesn't work that way, but if that's true, then the federal law is telling states to keep sports wagering prohibitions on the books if they have them, which does begin to sound a little bit like puppeteering uh, the state legislative processes. Very, very interesting case. En banc Third Circuit said no commandeering. Uh, really uh, interesting opinion by Judge Rendell for the majority, nine or 10 judges. 
really interesting opinion from Judge, oh, I'm gonna say, uh, I, get, I get this wrong, Vanaski, I'm gonna say Zabriskie, but that's, a, that's different. Um, Vanaski uh, saying, no, 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 this is commandeering. Um, and and it, very, very interesting, uh, big lawyers on both sides, Ted Olson arguing for New Jersey, Paul Clement, I assume, will be arguing for uh, the sports leagues, a huge, huge federalism case. I must say just one point and then I'll stop. The first time around, I thought this was fascinating, the first time around in the Third Circuit, uh, the, the, uh, the New Jersey lost and they sought cert. And the United States Solicitor General at the time, I think it was 2014, told the Supreme Court, well, look, there's nothing to worry about here because PASPA still allows New Jersey to repeal its sports wagering prohibitions in whole or in part. Nothing to worry about here. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's what they said. Um, and then so it went back. New Jersey did that. From New Jersey's perspective, they were just doing what they were told they could do. Um, and now, this time around, they find that repealing it means authorizing it by law. And so this is a big part of their argument. Um, and uh, it will remain to be seen uh, how the court uh, deals with this. Very, very interesting and important case. 18 states and the governors of three other states have weighed in in favor of New Jersey, also a bunch of associations like the National Governors Association and the National Conference of State Legislatures. Okay, um, sorry for the speed talking, but I wanted to get through all that. Thanks so Thank much. Um, and finally, we're gonna go to Carrie uh, Severino to talk about the redistricting case and Gil. Um, right. And then after that, I think we'll open it up some questions from the audience. Great. So um, anyone who's been, who follows the Supreme Court redistricting cases knows that um, what we're going to see here is basically uh, a, a follows a very typical pattern, which is a, a case comes up with sort of a messy history of facts, trying to interpret an even messier set of, of principles that have been derived from the Constitution and elsewhere uh, by judges. And then at the end of the day, they come up with a decision that, you know, changes or doesn't the actual contours of these districts and provides little to no guidance going forward for the future cases. So um, what, the, the backdrop that the case is coming from is, um, I guess, two major cases, um, neither of which had a clear majority. So this is what we're working with here. Um, Davis versus Bandiver in 1986 and Veith versus Jubilee in 2004. And the big question is, is partisan gerrymandering um, something that the courts can even address? Um, so it's, it's something that I think a lot of us feel uncomfortable with. I think a lot of the justices aren't happy about and, and may even have questions of whether it's, it, it should be inherently lawful at all. But it really, um, in, in many ways, boils these, that, that line of cases boils down to, is this something that courts can even look at? And uh, there's a lot of disagreement. Both of those cases came up with plurality sorts of decisions. Um, and uh, so in, in the 1986 case, they said, well, yeah, we think, we think you can come up with a judicial standard, and here's the standard we think kind of works, is there, is there partisan intent, is there a partisan effect? And then it, when the court reconsidered it in 2004, they said, look, we've been using this test for 18 years. It's proven to be virtually impossible to apply. So when they thought they were coming up with a, a, a discernible standard um, and then one that was manageable, it really wasn't. And there you had uh, a, a, a four justices who said, this is just a political question, Doctor, and that, you know, saying this, this is something that we can't, the court can't even look into because there's no, there's nowhere we can get a standard to apply here. Um, and then four justices who said, no, we can, we can look at partisan gerrymandering claims. And then Justice Kennedy. Justice Kennedy uh, concurred in that case, basically saying, well, I'm not willing to say you can, you can't prove a negative. I, and I would, I'm not willing to say it. there's no judicial, uh, judicially discernible standard until you could prove that there is no standard, which is, of course, logically impossible. So I'll just say, and this is, this is sort of fits with Justice Kennedy's general penchant toward not actually, you know, not, not completely coming down with a clear answer in, in, in everything he, he uh, can. So he, he basically said, I'm leaving the door open. In this one, this standard not, is not is not a use, there's no standard that they came up with in this case that satisfies me, but you know, who knows, eventually someone might come up with a standard. So Q 13 more years of litigation trying to guess what, you know, it, it guess what would Justice Kennedy do? What, would, what standard might be something that would appeal to him? And I suspect that that's going to be the out, what, what we see in the, in the case today. Now, it's significant that in that concurrence he did 
um, acknowledge that some levels of political gerrymandering actually is acceptable. That just the mere fact that you can point to, hey, politics were a factor in this, um, doesn't mean it's, it's overturned, which is a good thing because, frankly, that would probably mean that every single redistricting effort ever that has ever happened in this country would be unconstitutional because I can't imagine that there's, that, that there's ever been a case where politics has been wholly absent or maybe even predominantly absent. We've, we've, there's lots of evidence that uh, political gerrymandering has been happening for the entire history of the nation. Um, even if it has been criticized for the entire history of the nation. So um, the, the specific facts of this case, um, this, is, this has to do with Wisconsin redistricting. Um, and uh, basically, their, their current redistricting was, has been challenged by a group of 11 different plaintiffs. They, there's not one from every single one of the 99 districts. That becomes a, a problem as well. And uh, the court below, it was a three three judge court, as happens in these cases, uh, over, overturned their their current system and mandated that they redraw the lines. In the meantime, significantly, the court stayed that order. So, uh, when they when they accepted this case, they actually stayed simultaneously the the order to redraw the district lines. The state was arguing we shouldn't need to do this. We, why not just wait for the Supreme Court to tell us whether they're okay or not? It's going to be a huge amount of time, effort, state, uh, in, in attacks on state resources to do so. And that's that's very interesting. First of all, it's interesting because four justices did not want to stay that order. So I think it's safe to say that, and those are the typical four liberal justices, I think it's safe to say they likely um, are, lean toward the, the, the fact that there's a, a real potential for these, uh, these districts to be overturned on the political gerrymandering. Uh, basis, um, and then five justices obviously must have voted to stay, and that, that we know which five they were because they didn't dissent from from deny, from the uh, stay. So um, the other five justices, and of course, want, said said that they, this uh, order was, of the lower court was going to be stayed. Uh, that suggests that they also may have a thumb on the scale in terms of thinking that there is a, a success uh, likelihood of success in the merits in this case. Um, so the the real questions being considered here. Um, are, first of all, a, a serious question of standing. You, as I mentioned, you have people from a subset of the districts, uh, one-ninth of the districts are represented in the case, but they're challenging statewide the redistricting. And this is, has been, uh, does raise an issue of, of do they have standing to do so? Do they have a, a particularized injury um, as to something that happened in another state? There, there's, you know, for example, one, one plaintiff was in a predominantly Democratic district that was won by the Democrats. So, you know, where's the harm what, uh, under, both, under both pre and post this, this new redistricting? Um, and uh, and the, the appellants, in this case it's appellants, not petitioners, point out that this could be a problem because it, in racial redistricting cases, um, typically you have to be from the actual district you are challenging. You can't just challenge statewide uh, racial redistricting. They said it would be a very perverse result if it's harder to get into court to challenge racial gerrymandering than it is to challenge partisan gerrymandering. In a world where we all, you know, we, we have a specific constitutional amendment addressing uh, the right to vote, and, and, and it's very clear that the Equal Protection Clause is supposed to address that as well. Um, and, and yet, the, historically, we've political gerrymandering has almost been a safe harbor and, and an escape from racial gerrymandering claims. Traditionally, when, when the states come in and they say, you're racially gerrymandering. They say, oh, no, it's just politics. And we had one of those last term. Oh, it's OK. This is just politics. Oh, OK, good. You can do political gerrymandering. Um, it would be very strange to say that it's actually easier to make those political gerrymandering claims, which have been traditionally been kind of let go when, when you wouldn't be able to um, challenge a law for, for racial gerrymandering. I think uh, then the, they, they have five questions presented. It's, it's, it's an amazing number, which also differ from the appellee's five, four questions presented. So I think the court goes with the appellants. It seems they didn't, they didn't edit those. Um, and then second, they ask if, if there is a safe harbor under the Veith case. That was the 2004 case, case for traditional redistricting principles. So if you are using these traditional principles, do you have a safe harbor? Because they, they point to all of these traditional principles they had looked at. Um, and and uh, so the court will look at that. And then uh, they, uh, they criticize, in the, in the third question presented, they say, are we just going back to the Davis versus Bandemer standard? So the standard proposed in this case uh, is very similar in some ways to that, that uh, standard of the plurality in Davis that seems to have been 
uh, updated in the 2004 case and, and not adopted by them, um, or certainly at least four members of the court said it wasn't workable and Justice Kennedy suggested it wasn't workable, and that was the combination of intent and effect, discriminatory intent and discriminatory effect um, in, the, in the law. The, the appellees in this case propose a third prong as well on their test, which and they, they, they specify that it, it has to be a, a significant uh, discriminatory effect, and they, they use particular social science, uh, you know, they, they have a particular social science standard they have developed, the efficiency test, although the court didn't even apply that, they applied yet another slightly different test, so there's, there's a, a million tests already in the room. And then they also add the third one, which is that they don't have a, you can't kind of justify it. Maybe it's sort of a burden shifting thing of, well, if you can shift then the burden back and say there's a neutral reason we, we, um, we had this discriminatory or apparently partisan discriminatory effect, then we can get out of this. Um, so, so the question, th that question seems to ask, is this just the same uh, dis disfavored test that was used in a previous one? Um, and then there's there, the last two, well, the, the, the fourth one has to do with whether they can, whether the trial went well. So uh, effectively, did the court come up with this new standard midway through and they didn't have the opportunity to introduce proper evidence because the court did kind of invent a new standard after, um, after it had already been, uh, uh, the, the, that three-part test had already been proposed uh, by the, the appellees and the plaintiffs in that case. And then finally, whether these claims are even justiciable at all. So I think they're there, I, I think, is going to be um, a, it come, it's an, up, an uphill battle for the appellants just insofar as Justice Kennedy has already asserted that he can, you cannot prove a negative. I, I doubt that in the intervening 13 years he has been convinced that now now it really is, is clear there's no judicial, judicially discernible standards, but whether he'll find this one any more compelling than he found the last one um, is also a question, uh, a, a, a tough question for me. So I, I'm not sure how, how, if they'll be able to distinguish the test, and that's how, what's going to be going on in the oral arguments. You'll have the appellant saying, look, this is just like V, this is no more, this is more use, no more useful a test, and frankly, you should throw us all out on standing in the first place. And then you'll have the appellees saying, no, in the, in the intervening time we've seen uh, the amount of partisan gerrymandering increase. We've seen new technologies which make it easier and more effective to do partisan gerrymandering because we can pick and choose who lives exactly where with these great computer programs and data collection things we have. Um, and plus we have this new, shiny new social science test that you can apply. Um, whether that, you know, whether that's compelling, I, I, don't, I don't think it'll be compelling to the four members of the court who already think this is not politically justiciable or this is not judicial justiciable because it's a political question, but I do think um, it's possible that you could, you, you, we might see Justice Kennedy swayed one way or the other. Even more likely though, just based on, you know, the, the pattern we see in these cases, that it's not, there's not going to end up with a very clear uh, test by the end of the day, however this ends up working out. I wanted to co just comment, since I know we're at the end here, about, because I think some of the interesting, we have so many interesting cases today, but some of the most interesting ones almost are, are that form some themes in this term haven't even been granted yet. So just to flag a couple of them. First, um, we had, you know, Kyle mentioned the Masterpiece Cake Shop uh, speak, uh, compelled speech case, or at least the one aspect of it is compelled speech. And I wanted to flag a case from the Seventh Circuit, the Janus case, which is also a compelled speech that in the context of public sector uh, unions, many will remember from a couple terms ago, the Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association case that was uh, heard just before Justice Scalia's death. I think everyone thought that it was a clear five vote victory for uh, not being able to force public sector uh, employees to pay, uh, not technically dues, but effectively a, a very similar amount to a union that they didn't want to be a member of. Um, so it was a compelled speech in that case. It seemed like it was going to overturn the, the precedent that allowed that to take place, that compelled speech to take place, and uh, then Justice Scalia died. I think um, this could be the kind of reboot of that case, and if so, I would, I would suggest, suspect that Justice Gorsuch would also be very critical of um, the Abood line of cases, which is which is uh, what was at issue there, and would also th that could also be a, a very interesting case. And then the second set is uh, kind of fits along with the oil states case that that Andrew's talking about. Um, it, they have to do with these major structural constitutional issues. There's two cases coming out of the D.C. Circuit, the CFPB, one, one challenge to the constitutionality of the CFPB, um, a, that the CFPB lost and then was reheard on banc, and then also one challenging the constitutionality of administrative law judges called, called Lucia. In that case, um, the, uh, the 
petitioner or the, the, the plaintiff lost and the SEC won, but also it was, uh, I think I can't remember if that one's gone on bank or is going on bank at the, at the D.C. Circuit. And I think those are both very significant. They make similar types of arguments of here is a, in the, in the case of the CFPB, here's an agency that is not constitutionally organized. You have someone who they, they have no check on the head of this agency, either from the Congress or from the president with removal powers, et cetera, and, and how can this exist in our constitutional system? And similarly, the challenge to the administrative law judges. Um, and it, it kind of fits a little bit with what's going on in the oil states case, where you have really a parallel um, quasi-judicial system going on there. I'll point out that I do think, in, in terms of the oil states case, that I, I, I agree it's going to turn on the, the question, really, of whether patents are property. But I think when you look at the history, there's actually some really strong historical evidence all the way from, from our 18th century cases in American law to, uh, to common law cases in Europe. I mean, the, the Seventh Amendment talks about cases at common law and that patent cases in England had been dealt with at common law. So it seems like this is, it, it, it fits very squarely into the concept of here's a property right. And when you pair that with some of the real serious due process issues that are going on there, I mean, we obviously there's the, the, the question of is this, are these people appointed properly at, at, under Article One or Article Three? But I think uh, the, when you look at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board and the, the due process questions they've had, whether it's stacking panels or you know just the, the uh, standards of proof are very different than that you would have in an Article Three court, et cetera, and, and they seem to, with a with a over two thirds, I think patent um, invalidation rate, and they seem to have a sort of an agenda <laughs> that uh, that doesn't seem terribly well uh, well masked, or maybe I'm not sure they're even intending to. I think they sort of view it as their agenda to try to get rid of as many patents as they can, um, and, and that's something the chief judge has embraced to a certain extent. Um, I think that, that that's exactly what our constitutional system was designed to protect against by having having all these due process guarantees that we have, and so um, I think that'll be really interesting when you if, if if the court is I think if they think they ought to recognize that this if this is actually a property right to have a a, a, a roving uh, it's been called a death squad for patents going out there without any any due process protections is is really a, a very problematic constitutionally, and so. All three of those cases will will form an interesting, you know, way for the court to review what those constitutional uh, structural uh, protections are are there to protect. So. Thanks so much, Carrie, and and I just want to say thank you to all our panelists. I mean, I've got it. It was. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the the context and insight uh, in what's going to be a, a, a really, I think, exciting term, and then obviously cases on the horizon as well. Um, I thought we'd take a few questions um, uh, briefly. If there's anything that you guys um, would like to kind of flag, or if our panelists would like to, while well, people might want to come to the microphone, anything that you would like to weigh in on while we're waiting. Well, while we're waiting, I'll just say a word about Carpenter. I, I just want to echo what Oren said about how, in a way, the focus on the cell phone location data is, the, is, is really the least relevant uh, kind of third-party information. If you think of your own information and you know the emails, documents, photographs you have stored in the cloud, right? those are all in the hands of a third party. All of the information, you know, if you've got a Fitbit, all the information that that device collects is stored in some Fitbit computer somewhere. So multiply it by that by every kind of device that you use. There's a huge, huge amount of data that is now in the hands of third parties that just, you know, let alone in the 1780s, even in the 1980s, uh, didn't exist. And and what the court decides about the parameters for for government access to that is just going to be critical. Uh, for privacy protection for the next number of years. Just a word about the consumer, the arbitration cases. The Consumer uh, Financial Protection Board also has a rule banning class action arbitration. The CFPB, of course, its constitutional status, as uh, was pointed out, is, is up in the air because it's the single member agency, not a multi member agency. And it's not supervised by the president. And on top of that, it doesn't have to worry about congressional appropriations because it gets its money from the Federal Reserve. So it really is a power unto itself. That's another case. I think there's an overlap or connection between Chevron issues and the uh, survival of these class action, uh, no class action provisions. Uh, because I think in both cases, at least certainly in the NLRA case, there is a question whether the board has this authority 
to begin to regulate non-union systems. Uh, it, it has the authority to protect people as they seek access to whatever four are available out there if they involve workplace issues, but the board does not have the authority to regulate those, those fora. So it's, it's not just an F Federal Arbitration Act question, it's a statutory authority question, and it raises the issue of Chevron, uh, especially in a context uh, where the, the agency is reaching out beyond its usual sphere of responsibility. I want to, um, if no one has any questions for the, at the mics, I want to kind of ask us to kind of go to about 10,000 feet and just look broadly at what we see as themes that might be emerging from this term. Or, you know, if you want to talk about Justice Gorsuch, um, I mean, obviously it looks like he's uh, developing some relatively predictable voting patterns, though justices certainly can change. But I, if you could just kind of step back and just uh, give us some of your broader thoughts on whether a justice, a theme, uh, potential retirements. Um, you want to start with you? Kat? Sure. Um, one thing that occurred to me as I was listening to the comments was that we've got a new administration. Obviously, we've got a new solicitor general. We've got a new justice department. We've got a new attorney general. As SG was just confirmed. Um, I'd be curious to see what effect on the court May, may happen from the change in position from one administration to the other on important legal issues. Um, I, I forgot to mention that in the Masterpiece K case, the, United, the, uh, the Justice Department has filed a brief on behalf of the petitioner uh, in that case. And I don't know if formally that's a change of position. I, I just don't know. Uh, but it has raised eyebrows that the, the, the um, U.S. The SG's office came in on the side of the petitioner. Um, I may be mistaken, Andy, forgive me if I am. I thought you said that the uh, DOJ might have changed position in some way in the arbitration cases. Um, in yeah, total, oh, absolutely. In, absolutely. In, absolutely. The petition for good, the I just didn't want to overstate they, it. <laughs> good, 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 good. Good. So totally. Um, I, I mentioned that in the Christie case, the uh, SG had seemed to take a position that was sort of pro-New Jersey being able to repeal its laws back in 2014. I don't know what their position is going to be in this new case. Um, that's curious and, and interesting dynamic on the court to watch. All right, we have a question. Thank you. Um, and Carrie, thanks for the plug for the Janus case. My colleagues litigating that. Um, my question would be in regard to the new Solicitor General, as I'm sure that most of the people in, in, on the panelists, maybe in this room, know, uh, Noel Francisco litigated the Noel Canning case, mm -hmm. um, which uh, Judge Santel's decision in, in the DC Circuit was a model of originalist thinking. Does anyone foresee a greater um, a focus on originalism from the SG's office now that he's uh, in charge of that uh, shop? Well, I, I certainly would view that as a wonderful step forward. I, I, I think there's a lot of cases that we've talked about already where that, that factor could play in, whether it's, you know, um, some of the, the, the original understanding of whether patents are property or, or um, what searches and seizures are and how we play that into today. I mean, there's all of these cases, I think, could benefit from some analysis on that front, what the original understanding of whether you know, partisan gerrymandering is or isn't something the courts can even look at. I, mean, I think that there's a lot of them that have that, that factor in them, so we certainly if might. If you have a good original understanding that. argument, use it. That's my motto. <laughs> um, You're not going to lose your votes. I, we were going to wrap up at 2. We got started just a few minutes late, so if it's okay with people in the audience, we could have another question and then maybe have our panelists just kind of say uh, some Kenneth concluding Jones remarks. Kenneth Supreme Court yearbook. Uh, <clears throat> at one of these sessions, one other expert suggested that Justice, Ju Justice Thomas's joining the court pushed Justice O'Connor toward the left and I wonder whether, and, and his implicit suggestion was, Justice Gorsuch's joining the court might push Justice Kennedy to the left. I wonder um, what any of you have to say to right, about Jimmy, that possible means, prediction. Don't you mean to the right? What do you mean to the left? I think to the left. No, yeah. to the left. no, I'm, no he's, he said Gorsuch, Justice. Oh, I see. As, as a reaction to his yeah. former clerk. It, it, a backlash. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I think one, one point I've made along those lines is I, th I think it is different when you're, so Justice Thomas replaced Justice Marshall, which is definitely a, a shift in approach on the court, right? Justice Gorsuch replacing Justice Scalia to the extent that Justice Kennedy, I assume, would, would, would be the likely one, in addition to the fact that he obviously knows Justice Gorsuch better and so maybe he's less likely to 
react negatively to him. It seems like there's no need to shift in order to maintain the balance. The balance of the court is actually pretty much exactly where it was two years ago, right? So um, I don't know whether that will play into it or whether there's more interpersonal things. But if you're, if you're worried as a justice, do I need to balance a shift, there's no shift. I mean, I think even before Justice Scalia passed away, you could look at the court as the, the conservative side of the court as having sort of three, uh, two distinct groups, right? Three and two. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that distinction is probably becoming even more pronounced if you just look at the recent decisions, even yesterday's uh, stay in a death penalty case. So it seems to me one way of looking at the court is you have, you have a sort of a three justice group, Justices Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. You have the Chief Justice and Justice Kennedy, maybe more toward the middle. On the left, you probably have Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan, a little bit toward the center. And you probably have on some, obviously this is an oversimplification, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor in a different place. So I don't, I think, you know, the sort of paradigm is, oh, it's, you know, 414 and Justice Kennedy is in the middle. You know, that's sometimes true, but I think it's actually the breakdown is a little more complicated. I think the more significant change is Justice Scalia is not there anymore, because I think he had an enormous impact on how the cases were argued and reasoned by the justices. So the very strong emphasis on textualism uh, that he imparted, uh, I think, is not there in the same way. I don't think Justice Gorsuch at this point is going to play that role. I my, said, my question goes to the uh, Masterpiece uh, cake, uh, case and whether, um, uh, given that we are now in a post uh, Obergefell um, situation, uh, what are the implications uh, for this uh, litigation in terms of balancing different interests that are at stake? I think it's extremely important. Um, I think you you were seeing these kinds of uh, sort of, uh, to coin a phrase, I mean, wedding vendor, wedding participation kind of cases arising, popping up. Um, uh, there was the Elaine photography case out of New Mexico, I think. Um, that presented some, some of the similar issues to this one. The court turned it down. Um, you, you had the Stormans case out of the Ninth Circuit, which didn't have to do with same-sex rights, but it had to do with sort of forced participation against someone's religious conscience and behavior they didn't want to participate in. In that case, it was distributing uh, Plan B, I think. That, that was turned down by the court over a very strong dissent by Justice Alito. Um, and now the court's waiting in. Um, and, and I think the way you put it is right. I think the court as a whole will be struggling to find the proper balance. Um, and um, they won't be able to make everyone happy, of course. Not in these cases, you never do. But the sort of balance that they decide to strike in this case, uh, it won't determine every case after it, but it will set a template, I think, uh, for how these issues are to be worked out. It's very important. Um, well, again, I'd like to thank everyone uh, here for this enlightening conversation. And thanks to the Federalist Society and Lee for uh, bringing the panel together and for giving me the opportunity to moderate it, um, which I said is just, wish we had another few hours to go on. Um, I'm going to just ask if there are any final thoughts, any points that you guys want to make. And then sadly, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Lauren, you wanted, I know you were quiet about Justice Kennedy. <laughs> I remember he Clark. Or, is he going to retire this yeah, year? Yeah, I have no inside information. Uh, so so uh, I think a really interesting dynamic to watch this term is going to be the reaction of the justices beyond Justice Kennedy, although including Justice Kennedy, to our, the, the current occupant of the White House. Um, you know, we, there's been writing in the popular press uh, and on blogs and the like about um, some Trump effect of sort of, you know, justices or judges thinking, wait a minute, uh, this, we've got a, a different situation here in the White House and we should be modifying how we approach certain issues in response. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see a couple of big cases this term that reflect some sort of Trump effect at some level. Whether that should happen or not, of course, is separate, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do. Anyone in particular you're going to be watching? I mean, obviously, you could make the argument that the lower courts and the travel pause cases certainly were yeah. doing that. Th that. That's, I think, the easiest one to watch, but we may see it in other cases, too. Mm -hmm. And that, that effect overlaps with a general concern among a number of the justices about the administrative state 
and Chevron and the separation of powers issues that we've been talking about. And so I think it is just another factor at play in all of these cases that will involve deference to agencies, structure of agencies, responsiveness of agencies to the political process. Uh, all of that is sort of of a piece. A concern I have is the Trump effect is, is it's people are going to forget, I think, about the, the institutional values that need to survive the democracy and uh, you know, uh, the, the willingness to entertain this uh, impeachment evidence, for example, the travel gate case, and we're seeing it in other cases, the sanctuary cities case. We've got to think about the issue of what effect it will have on the institution of the presidency going forward. Do you think that's the reason that the court kind of handled the travel ban case the way they did? Because they didn't want to reach a decision in that case? I think it played a role. Yeah. I think it played a role. All right. Well, thank you guys again so much. Thank that was, you. Uh, that was fantastic. <laughs>